Welcome to Primary Care Today on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Brian McDonough, and with me today is Dr. Mark Mirabelli. He's Assistant Professor of the Department of Orthopedics, Family Medicine, and Physiatry at the University of Rochester. Very important topic today, one I think that's very important for most of us, and that is something we might take for granted, the pre-participation physical. And without a doubt, it is extremely important as we learn more and more about issues that can occur with athletes. It may not be the simple pre-participation physical we looked at maybe 20, 30 years ago. We know a lot more and a lot more needs to be done. So first of all, Dr. Mirabelli, welcome to the program. Thank you. It's my pleasure for being here. Um, my first question for you, I mean, I kind of teed it up that way as being so important, but it really is an important exam. Tell me a little bit about what you highlight and what we should be focusing on. So the pre-participation evaluation is an exam that's designed to maximize the benefits to athletes who are participating in sport at all different types of levels while minimizing any unnecessary intrusion into their health. So what we'd like to do is to make sure they can participate in sports safely and not take them out of sports when they don't need to be out. And when you're trying to talk about maximizing the safety, what are the things you're looking for in those, those first exams? Well, ostensibly, the idea is to reduce mortality so people don't die doing athletic activities. However, most of the evidence to date has shown, at least in the United States, that we're not very good at doing that. We have not really achieved significant mortality benefits. However, I think you can look at it more broadly by saying that we want to reduce morbidity. People who have problems that could be fixed, problems that can be treated, problems that may prevent them from doing certain sports, we can hopefully pick those kinds of things up. For example, an athlete who's had a history of recurrent ankle sprains, that's something we should be able to detect by history and physical on our PPE. And that's something perhaps that we can do something about so the athlete doesn't continue to have recurrent ankle injuries during their season. There's a lot of people who talk, and they talk at length, about the importance from a cardiac standpoint. We hear of stories of a young athlete in high school maybe who collapses on the soccer field or the football field or those things. Are these things we can help pick up through this exam? Absolutely. The reality, again, is that although we're not very good at reducing morbidity and mortality, there are certainly a number of guidelines out there on how to go about screening people for potentially life-threatening problems, particularly those of the cardiac variety. At, at minimum, I think the recommendation would be from the American Heart Association, they have a 14-point guideline on how to screen people for cardiac problems prior to participating. And I'd like to review those points with you. Sure. It's a combination of a history and physical. And what we want to do is go over a variety of points. So the first is asking the athlete, do they have chest pain or discomfort when they're exerting themselves? We ask them, do they ever get dizzy or lightheaded? Feel like they're going to pass out or have passed out when they exercise? We're going to ask them if they have unexplained and excessive fatigue associated with exercise. We'll ask them if they have abnormal shortness of breath when they exercise. We'll inquire about a history of any heart murmurs. We'll evaluate for one of those. Check for them for high blood pressure. We'll ask them if they have a history of sudden death in the family before the age of 50 or significant heart disease in the family before the age of 50. We'll also ask them if there's any family history of any other cardiac problems or things like Marfan syndrome. We'll evaluate their femoral pulses. We'll take a look to see if they have any evidence of something like Marfan syndrome. We'll do a regular blood pressure on them. And we'll ask them if they've ever been restricted from sports in the past or have ever had any cardiac testing. Those basic points are a base level of screening for cardiac problems. And I think that's at minimum what everybody should be doing on a pre-participation evaluation. I think that's really great to uh, summarize it that way. And probably I think a lot of people, we, we think about what we're supposed to do, but we don't necessarily highlight those things and have such a systematic approach. And, and that's very helpful. Yeah, and I think the important point is to kind of be systematic about it. The good news is that the pre-participation evaluation does come in a fairly standardized form. Uh, the PPE actually has a monograph. It's version 4 that came out several years ago now, published and endorsed by a variety of medical societies, primarily the American Academy of Pediatrics and American Academy of Family Physicians. And it's something that can be obtained easily online. Those forms can be used. It's a very standardized way to go about doing those things that we talked about. When you talk about getting the athlete into the office for pre-participation, is it usually just the August exam? Do you get them throughout the year? What's the peak time as you see it? 
Well, peak time certainly is in August prior to the start of the fall athletic season, but the reality is we can be doing them at any time of year, and certainly depending on the type of sport or on the level of athlete that you take care of, you may do them at different times of year. For me, I take care of high school, college, and professional teams in my practice, and so I will be doing physicals throughout the year, either in my office or at the athletic facility where the teams practice and play. When you got involved in this as a family doctor, you started to gravitate towards the sports medicine. Is that how you, you got closer to doing this type of work more often? Yeah, so I, 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 like a lot of people, I'm a big sports fan, and I grew up playing a variety of sports. Not very well, I might say, but good enough to get through high school at least. And, uh, and I got into med school and discovered that there was a field that I could do sports medicine and differently than from a surgical standpoint. And so I did a fellowship after I finished my residency, and I've been very interested in the PPE since really the time I did my fellowship. And for someone, let's say, who's younger, they're thinking about this now, they're early in their career, what are the steps you suggest they take if they're interested in this? Well, I think sports medicine is obviously a pretty exciting and fun field. It's a very popular fellowship out of the primary care route, also from the orthopedic surgical route, too. Plus, there's a number of other ways to access sports medicine, even if you don't go into the medical field. You can go at it through athletic training and physical therapy and nutrition, sports psychology, all these other different complementary or allied fields that you can get into sports medicine. But if you're a medical student right now, really the way is to try to explore initially, do you want to be a surgeon or do you want to be a medical doctor? That's really kind of your first decision tree, I think. And for people who are interested in they they look at it, are there any things in residency you suggest as far as that extra exposure? What should they be doing at that early stage? So depending on the type of residency people do for primary care, family medicine really has a pretty rigorous background requiring at least two months of training in orthopedics and sports medicine. As part of that residency, some of the other primary care fields may not have as much exposure, and those residents would have to kind of go out of their way to do this. But at least within family medicine, most programs will at least have those two months, and they may offer more electives. If people plan to be doing a lot of sports medicine coverage, I definitely urge them to do electives during the time of their residency. They may also want to consider joining a number of professional societies, such as the American College of Sports Medicine or the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine. And these organizations, obviously, I'm sure, help provide guidance and give little tips for people throughout their career. Absolutely. These are lifelong professional societies that are really uh, include the, the uh, most important figures in our field and provide a variety of guidelines and position statements that you can use in your practice every day. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Primary Care Today on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Brian McDonough, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Mark Mirabelli. We're talking about the pre-participation physical, and that exam, that physical examination, top to bottom, how long do you usually spend in the pre-participation physical, and how does that compare to the normal physical exams or other physical exams you'd be doing on the standard patient? So I would say it depends on the setting that I'm doing it. Many times in my own office, I'll be doing the PPE as really part of a well-child visit or as a routine physical. And those typically are scheduled as half-hour visits with me. When I'm doing them in the athletic center, perhaps dealing with a college team or a professional team, the exams are a bit faster. We have a lot more forms done in advance, and our exams are a lot more focused as well. So I might actually spend myself about 15 minutes with a patient with a variety of ancillary staff performing uh, other parts of the exam. That's interesting because I'm always interested in how you approach it and do those, you know, specialized types of exams, yet you're thinking of so many other things. I wanted to ask you, too, I mean, you're in a pre-participation physical, you're dealing with that, but with adolescents in particular, there's so many other areas to talk about. Um, do you get an opportunity to talk about anticipatory guidance and those sorts of things in that setting? And, and how open are the adolescents to talking with you? So adolescents are certainly a special age to deal with. As we all know, there's a variety of sensitive topics that start to come up in that age group. And it's not always easy to address. I think if you're the primary care physician for that athlete, it's probably the most ideal way to go about addressing them in the you know, medical home type setting. So in the office where you've had a long-term relationship with the athlete, it's probably a little bit easier to bring those types up, those types of topics up. And you can use standardized things like a GAPS assessment or other types of adolescent risk assessment forms. The PPE form itself actually does include some screening questions for adolescent risk issues. So for example, problems with weight, problems with drug and substance abuse, violence, and sexual health. So there's a variety of ways of doing that. When we're doing it in college or professional setting, again, those questions are on the form, 
many athletes don't always feel comfortable raising those topics in that setting. I know a lot of doctors who are listening to this program also, you know, they do these exams, and one of the concerns is picking up suspicious murmurs, you know, those types of things which you might be able to pick up on an exam. What sorts of things are you looking for in the pre-participation physical exam, you know, with, with concerns about heart issues and irregular rhythms and that sort of thing? So particularly with heart issues, uh, it's, it's really important to try to identify whether the athlete has a known or pre-existing problem or whether there's something new going on that has not yet been evaluated. So it's a question of whether you're screening for a problem that's already there or whether you're dealing with a problem that is already known about. Once you know of a problem or it's already been evaluated, the 36th 36 Bethesda guidelines, again published by the American Heart Association or College of Cardiology, provide a really stepwise fashion and how to decide what types of activities are safe for these athletes to participate in. The real problem, in my opinion, is dealing with the athlete who doesn't have any symptoms and who doesn't have anything that we know is wrong. Most people who have cardiac problems are going to be picked up prior to these exams, but minor problems or subtle problems can be occult and very difficult to evaluate. Even with that 14-point exam that we talked about, with the history and physical, you may still miss things. So there's been an emerging thought about maybe doing further types of screening utilizing either ECG or ECG plus echocardiography. I guess the other thing is you can't really tell in many cases who is at risk. You're, you're caught by surprise. There's, there's no warning sign too, right? Yeah, unfortunately, one of the old saws about this is the initial presenting complaint for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which is the most common cause of sudden cardiac death in young athletes under the age 35 in the United States is sudden death. So they have no previous symptoms whatsoever. And while you may find that they have outflow tract obstruction, so they'll have a dynamic murmur that you can elicit with valsalva maneuver, you may not find that at all on your exam. And again, I know you're focusing on it at these points, but I think a lot of times the general public is looking at it like, well, why didn't they pick that up on exam? And it's hard many cases to explain that because uh, you obviously are doing all the best you can at the time, but that may not be anything that's giving you that clue or that warning. I think what you said off the top is really important, at least from my perspective. It's obvious you get a great history. You try to get everything you possibly can that might indicate that there's some risk. That's true. I think we probably owe the general public more education on really not only what our strengths are as physicians, but also what our limitations are. And I think many of us as physicians understand innately that we have only so much that we are capable of doing. But the general public puts a lot of trust in the medical profession for good reason. But I think we owe them more education at understanding that there's only so much we're able to detect with standard methods. You're listening to Primary Care on ReachMD. I'm Dr. Brian McDonough, your host. We only have a couple minutes left. I wanted to ask you things that I did not bring up that you really wanted to bring up while you have this physician audience. Any things you'd like to target? Well, in addition to the cardiac screening, which is so very important, we go over a lot of other screens. Uh, I wanted to highlight just a couple of those other things that are important to take a look at during the exam. The first is pulmonary issues. So asthma primarily is the thing that we're interested in in athletes. As we know, a asthma is a potential cause of death. It is also a very treatable and, and certainly a preventable cause of death. We recommend that make sure that every athlete is screened for asthma. It's asked on the standard form if they have a history of it. If they do, we want to further risk stratify them by deciding whether it's an intermittent or persistent type and how it's being treated. Is it being treated adequately? If the athlete is actively wheezing on the exam, and we certainly don't want to clear them at that point. We want to make sure they get further care. We also want to make sure that that athlete has a rescue inhaler available to them at all times. Most of the professional teams I deal with will have the athletic trainers carrying a rescue inhaler as a spare or a backup, but every athlete should be responsible for making sure they provide their own inhaler. So pulmonary issues are an important one. Another one, and one that's certainly a real hot-button topic for my field in sports medicine, is concussion. So sports-related concussion really is, we see as sort of an epidemic in the United States. There's growing awareness of how common this is and potentially how serious these injuries can be. And concussions are certainly, again, something that we ask about during the normal exam. If somebody has had a recent concussion or remain, and remains symptomatic from it, these are people we clearly do not want to clear to go back to play sports at that point. We want to make sure that they get adequate treatment. It gets very controversial what to do with these athletes who've had multiple concussions. At this point, we don't have agreement in the field as to how many is too many. But we certainly know at this point, though, 
that the more concussions you've had, the greater the risk it is you'll likely develop some type of neurologic problem later in life. So we worry about these athletes with multiple concussions. These are people who may need further risk stratification through counseling or a more focused neurologic exam or neuropsychological testing. So those are, I think, two more important points that I'd really like to highlight. Well, Dr. Mark Mirabelli, time has really flown during this program. I want to thank you for joining us on this program and providing your insights on the pre-participation exam. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. I'm Dr. Brian McDonough. If you missed any or part of this discussion, please visit reachmd.com slash primary care today. You can download the podcast and learn more on this series. Thanks again for listening.